it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. The Mimic by Sinister's Return 567 Ah, dunno Chris, eldritch abominations are kind of old hat at this point. My brother Terry had said after reading over a rough draft of the latest story I was writing. His words stung more than I think he intended them to because, though I wouldn't admit it outright, I knew that they were true. Oh, come on Terry. I don't have to reinvent the wheel every time I sit down to write. I'd huff back at him, somewhat annoyed. Yeah, true, but stories with big, creepy, indefinable entities are just so overdone. Lovecraft cornered that market decades ago, and the internet is absolutely saturated with stories like that. Well, what kind of creatures do you think I should write about? (sighs) What about vampires? I couldn't contain my disappointed sigh at that suggestion. Vampires are probably the most overdone monsters in the genre. Besides, they aren't actually scary because everyone knows their weaknesses. So? Why does that matter? It matters because if the audience knows the monster's weakness, then they gain a sense of control of it, and any sense of fear evaporates. The essence of any good horror story is a lack of control, I said, Sounding almost like a professor giving a lecture. Well, Terry threw his hands in an overly exaggerated expression of defeat. (sighs) If you say so, maestro. I didn't want to come off as a conceited dickhead that couldn't take criticism, so I decided to concede that he did have a point. Look, they might be old hat, but they're easy to write about. That works for me right now. I feel like I'm in a rut creatively. I just can't seem to think of anything to write about like I used to. And everything I do write just feels so bland and unoriginal. I end up hating it before I get halfway down the page, I said, sounding more fatigued than I'd meant to. I pressed my head into my arms that lay folded on my writing desk in my less than tidy room in the two-story house Terry and I lived in with our parents and younger sister. Terry's expression said that he wanted to comfort me. I wasn't quite sure what to say. After a moment or so of uncomfortable silence, however, he did manage to think up some sincere-sounding words of encouragement. But I think you've just been too much of a perfectionist, Chris. Like you said, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you sit down to write. You just have to write what feels correct to you. Don't write to please an audience. Write to express yourself and remember what Mr. Talbot used to say. Harry's mention of the creative writing teacher we both shared in high school caused a wave of nostalgia to wash over me as I recalled the words that the gentle old man repeated to us at the every opportunity like it was his personal catchphrase. Uh, there are no original stories, only original ways to tell them. I mumbled this aloud. Terry smiled in agreement as he got up from where he sat on my bed and made his way to my bedroom door, glancing back over his shoulder at me and saying, I'm going to go make something to eat. I'll be back up in a bit, man. Take a break if you need to. Don't beat yourself up so much. The right idea will come to you in its own time. And you'll say to yourself, Eureka, I have something to write about now. And then, with theatrical fervor, he walked out, leaving me alone with my thoughts and a rough draft of a story that now looked like a horrid and detestable abomination to my eyes, staring back at me from the screen of my laptop. I lamented my inability to reach into the ethereal realm of imagination just long enough to pull out even the smallest embers of an idea, one that could in turn be nurtured into a fire from which I could forge words and sentences, and then use those to make paragraphs, and then build those paragraphs into a cohesive narrative that could be sold to a wide audience of readers that sought out even the smallest escape from the banal realities of their day-to-day lives with ravenous abandon, and I briefly considered deleting the whole thing in a fit of frustration, so I just opened up another tab in my web browser and stared monotonously, clicking on YouTube video after YouTube video, with the attention span of a squirrel stricken with ADHD. I'd listened to about half a horror story narration, whose overall plot sounded infuriatingly similar to the one I'd written when I my phone vibrating in my pocket. 
It was becoming relatively late at this point. The evening sun just about completed its descent under the horizon, painting the evening sky with deep hues of red and purple as it went. I could hear the soft patter of summer rain, like the subtle tapping of thousands of tiny little fingers against my window pane as I fished my phone out of my pocket to see who could be calling me. The number that flashed across my phone screen was not one I recognized, so I just declined the call as was my habit. Barely put the phone back in my pocket when it started vibrating again. I took it back out and peered at the screen. The same number was calling me again. I declined it again, only to have it call me a third time. Well, whoever it was, they seemed pretty darn desperate to get a hold of me. So, with my curiosity piqued, I decided to answer it. Hello? I got no immediate verbal response, but noted what sounded like running water and the steady, rhythmic clicking of something metallic in the background. I was half a second away from hanging up when a voice I didn't recognize finally spoke up. Hello, it said back to me. Who is this? Who is this? The voice repeated. You're the one who called, so you tell me, I said, already annoyed with this mystery caller. The voice on the other end simply repeated my words back to me again in a sarcastic, juvenile tone, the likes of which you'd expect to hear from a middle schooler, self-assured and totally convinced that his lame joke was in fact hilarious. You're the one who called me, so you tell me. The voice sounded like someone young trying to do an impression of someone much older, a gruff monotone that cracked at frequent intervals, revealing a softer and higher-pitched sounding voice that almost sounded feminine though, and well, I couldn't quite decipher if it was male or female. But regardless, it seemed obvious to me at this point that this was some bored kid's idea of a prank call. Since I wasn't really doing much anyway, I decided to play along for a minute. I'm an unoriginal dipshit. It said, waiting for the voice to repeat it. The voice let out a delighted giggle before saying, You're an unoriginal dipshit. Yeah, oh, very funny. Listen, kid, 1997 called and it wants this blame prank call back. If you're going to do shit like this, you need to be at least funny first. The voice didn't respond right away. I was about to hang up when it said, well, if you say so, maestro. And then, the line went dead. Hmm. Weird. My first immediate thought was that Terry must have been the prank caller, and that he'd probably used some kind of voice changer, the likes of which you could buy at a Halloween shop or order online. I made a mental note to chastise him for interrupting my work next time I saw him. Then I put my phone back in my pocket and went back to surfing the web, putting the strange prank call out of my mind. I spent another hour or so watching videos and intermittently adding a few new sentences to my story that seemed doomed to remain forever unfinished due to my own lack of creativity, before I decided to get up from my desk and go downstairs to make a pot of coffee, as I usually did when I needed to kickstart my imagination. Leaving my desk, I stepped over some dirty clothes that never managed to make their way to the hamper that laid at the foot of my bed, made my way out into the hallway. As I walked toward the stairs, I passed the washing machine and the dryer that lay in a closet just at the top of the stairs, and noted the familiar sound of running water and the steady rhythmic clicking of something metallic coming from the dryer as the machines worked through their wash cycles. Well, this was pretty common in my house, especially since Terry rarely ever bothered to check his pockets for change before he put his clothes through the wash, and the end result was always that metallic clicking sound as the change left in his pocket was tossed around in the dryer. This kind of solidified my idea that Terry was my mystery caller, and I resolved to go downstairs and make fun of him for his lame attempt at a prank while I made my coffee. I strolled down the steps at a leisurely pace and proceeded into the somewhat cluttered living room where I found Terry lounging on the couch, watching what looked like some old black and white noir film. The TV screen was filled with the image of a middle-aged man in an overcoat and a fedora. It seemed to be the trademark of the genre as he browsed what appeared to be a library bookshelf, absent-mindedly, before a woman approached him and asked, Can I help you, sir? Oh, yeah, I'm looking for a good mystery on something off the beaten track. 
Oh, like a Maltese falcon, he replied. The two characters bantered back and forth like that while Terry watched with intrigue, totally oblivious to my approach. I scooped the remote up off the couch and tossed it at him lightly, intending to startle him. Well, he jolted upward when the remote made its impact and whirled around with a scowl on his face. Oh, what the fuck, dude? That's for that lame prank call. You seriously gotta up your game, man. Well, it's hard to believe you called me unoriginal. Terry looked both perplexed and genuinely confused by my statements, being ever the dramatic actor that he was. What are you talking about? Oh, don't play dumb, Terry. The voice changer was a nice touch, but I could tell it was you on the phone. Nobody else calls me maestro. Phone? Voice changer? What the actual fuck are you talking about, man? Why would I call you for anything? You're literally in shouting distance. Yeah, sure, of course, Terry. You're clearly innocent. It was obviously the boogeyman who interrupted my writing session with a lame-ass prank call from the top of the stairs. I replied sarcastically. Terry's response was defensive. Look, man, if somebody prank called you, it wasn't me. I don't even have my phone on me. It's in my room on the charger. I'd expected him to smile and laugh while he admitted to making the call. Maybe even make a few well-intentioned jabs at my writing like he usually did. But his adamant refusal to accept responsibility began to sow seeds of doubt in my mind. <sighs> Look, cut the shit, man. I know it was you. I had to have been. I could hear the washer and dryer in the background. Terry opened his mouth to reply, but the words died on his lips as a loud crashing sound resonated from upstairs. Both of us turned a deathly pale. The sound was followed by loud scratching noises, like nails on a chalkboard, and then the quick pitter-patter of what sounded like small feet running quickly down the hallway, before silence prevailed throughout the house once again. I looked at Terry with undisguised fear in my eyes. Our sister was spending the night at a friend's house, and our parents were both working until late, meaning Terry and I were supposed to be alone in the house, so it goes without saying that we were both scared shitless by this development. After a few tense moments of silent stillness, I finally said to Terry, Go, oh, get something from the kitchen. He nodded, understanding that by something I meant a weapon we could use for self-defense, since it seemed clear that we were dealing with some kind of break-in. Without a word in response, he went to the kitchen and I followed close behind. We each grabbed the largest and sharpest kitchen knives we could find and proceeded back into the living room toward the stairs. I don't think I've ever taken longer to climb up a flight of stairs in my life than I did in those moments. Adrenaline slowed the flow of time down to a trickle, and each step felt like a mile. Even with Terry at my back, I don't think I'd ever been more scared in my life. As we both ascended the staircase, not knowing what the hell to expect, all of the typical sounds I usually associated with my house suddenly sounded alien and threatening. Every creak of a floorboard was an attacker about to ambush me. Every gust of wind that echoed from outside was a monster about to leap from the shadows. When we finally did make it to the top of the stairs found my bedroom door hanging open, and after getting closer, I saw what looked like some kind of weird geometric symbol on the inside of the door that looked as if someone had carved it into the wood with their fingernails. Fresh crimson droplets of blood ran down the door in some areas where the symbol had been drawn, and I almost gagged when I saw what looked like an entire blackened fingernail lodged in the door, as if someone had jammed their fingers into the wood of the door so deep with such haste that it literally tore off one of their fingernails, or drawing this weird arcane symbol that almost looked like a star with seven ugly points curved outward along the width of the door like talons with an inverted triangle at its center. What the fuck? I heard Terry say behind me as I slowly proceeded into my bedroom with the kitchen knife at the ready since I was now totally convinced that some psychotic teenager had just broken into our house. As I passed through the doorframe and into my room with Terry in tow, fear gave way to confusion as I looked around my bedroom expecting to find it ransacked after the commotion I'd heard from downstairs, only to find it neater than I'd left it just moments ago. Not just neater, 
wholly different in ways that shouldn't have been possible in the short time that I was downstairs. The wallpaper, for example, had been a dim, dingy green when I went downstairs to get coffee. But now it was a bright mustard yellow with this tacky floral pattern. My writing desk and laptop were in the same place as they were before I'd left. The laptop charger and even the outlet it was plugged into were now located on the opposite wall from where they were when I'd left. Clothes that had been strewn across the floor were now tidily folded and placed atop an ornate-looking dresser that I'd never seen before. The posters of various cartoon characters that had been on my walls had been replaced with framed portraits of people I didn't recognize. An old woman in an expensive-looking red satin dress with sad grey eyes, a middle-aged man in a dark overcoat with a bitter expression etched into his bearded face, and a yellow-eyed child whose face reached into the uncanny valley and disturbed me deeply. He looked normal at a glance, but the longer I stood and looked at him, the more off he seemed. His eyes were too far apart, and his prominent cheekbones were a bit too high, while his nose was a bit too low on his face looked less like a portrait of a real person, more like some alien who had never actually seen a human child before and had attempted to paint one based on a description of one alone. Terry and I must have stood there staring at my room's sudden transformation with slack jaw confusion and mounting terror for what felt like forever before the ring of the cell phone in my pocket snapped us back out of our stupor. I fished the phone out of my pocket with trepidation and felt my blood curdle in my veins when I looked at the screen, I saw my mystery caller's number flashing across it. Well, I answered it almost without thinking. Can I help you, sir? The voice asked, sounding delighted that I'd answered the phone on the first ring. What, what the fuck is going on? Who are you? What do you want? I'm looking for a good mystery off the beaten track, like, like the Maltese Falcon. Look, kid, I don't know how you got in here. Well, what do you want? But you're sick and you need to leave my house now. My brother and I are armed, and if you don't get the fuck out of here right now, somebody's going to get hurt. Somebody's going to get hurt. You need to leave my house now. It repeated with a demented giggle, adding emphasis on the word my, as if to say that this was not my house after all, but rather its, before the line went dead. My next immediate instinct was to call the police, and I ready myself to dial 911, only to have my heart sink as I found that I suddenly had no service. I turned back to Terry to see his face a pale, bloodless mask of dumbfounded confusion as he looked toward the doorway that led back into the hallway, and I followed his gaze to find that the plain, white wall of our hallway had been replaced by the same mustard-yellow wallpaper that now covered the walls of my room. Not only that, but on the wall directly opposite to my room, carved in the same grotesque manner as the symbol on my door, was a cryptic message of some kind that read, Seven points for seven doors, seven horns upon seven heads, and seven sacrifices asleep in their beds. What? <laughs> what the actual fuck? Terry wondered aloud in a bewildered voice, I had no words to form a reply. I could still hear the rain as it beat against the window pane from outside. Each drop against the glass sounded in my ears like the crack of thunder as my mind reeled from what was unfolding before me, and the sound brought me back to what I no leastly referred to as reality. I clutched the kitchen knife in my hand while I turned back to Terry. We have to get outside nodded in agreement, and we both bolted for the hallway toward the stairs, only to find them completely missing when we made our way out of my bedroom, replaced by a long hallway covered with that same ugly yellow wallpaper, and lined with countless doors, all etched with that same gruesome symbol, and portraits identical to the ones in my room hanging from the walls at regular intervals. Well, scared doesn't begin to describe what I felt as I looked down that long hallway where my stairs used to be. Nothing seemed to make sense anymore. I looked behind me to see what remained of my house's second floor, replaced by this hallway that seemed to stretch on endlessly until it faded from view. In a panic, I ran down the hallway as fast as I could, heedless to Terry's cries for me to slow down as I searched desperately for an exit and found only more of the hallway. 
That's when my phone rang out again. I hesitated to answer for only a moment before I accepted the call and brought the phone back up to my ear. Hello? I asked. Hello? The voice said. What is this place? Why are you doing this? The voice's response was petulant, like that of a child explaining the obvious. Because the essence of a good horror story is a lack of control. My response to this thing's twisted taunting died in my throat when I heard Terry scream somewhere far behind me, followed by the guttural growls of something that sounded utterly inhuman. Without thinking, I pocketed my phone and called out after him as I turned tail and ran back down the hallway looking for him, found only a massive pool of blood that started in the middle of the hallway and ended at one of the doors on the right. I approached the door slowly, with the kitchen knife still in hand, mortal terror making each step a Herculean task. The sharp hiss of the door's hinges made the hair on the back of my neck stand up as I stepped through the doorway, expecting to see something ghastly, only to see my empty bedroom just as I'd left it before I'd gone downstairs to harass Terry. I looked around in astonished bewilderment and saw that the strange hallway that had been there just a moment before I'd stepped through the doorway was now gone, replaced by my own second-floor hallway. I must have slammed and opened it again at least ten times, trying to get it open back up into that awful yellow hallway, but to no avail. I ran all throughout the house, calling out for Terry, only to be met with the silence of an empty house with my brother nowhere to be found. Left with no other options, I quickly donned my jacket and ran out of the front door into the freezing rain, toward the police station up the road, desperate to tell someone about what I'd just gone through. I must have made it halfway down the street when I heard my phone ring again. For the last time that night, I answered it with rage and indignation pouring from my voice. <sighs> What have you done with Terry? First, there was no answer. It was the steady sound of something metallic clicking in the background before the voice finally said, You have something to write about now, maestro. Then the line went dead. You'd think that hearing that awful voice next to the unmistakable sounds of my own washer and dryer would have terrified me, because that meant that whatever the thing was still in my house. But that's not what scared me the most about that final call. No. What scared me the most was that the voice now sounded exactly like Terry. The Companion A seven-year-old boy finds a doppelganger of himself while playing in his backyard. He does the worst thing he could have done. He brings him home. Chapter 1. Changed Plan I've been watching him for a few days now. He was seven, only child. I'd learnt his routine. Six hours at school, rest in the house, secure and out of reach. The only time he would come out was just a little before sunset, to play in his backyard. I watched him play all by himself, alone. I pitied him. He had no one to play with, but, well, that was ideal for me. This was the perfect time to strike. So I made a plan. The next evening, when he was playing in the backyard, throwing a ball around, I approached him from the bushes. He heard me and was alerted. He was looking in the bushes, and then, without any prompt, he threw a ball at me. I caught it. He knew that it wasn't an animal. He knew that whatever was in there, it had hands. He took a few steps backwards. Who's there? he asked. I slowly walked out of the bushes, holding the ball in my hands. He looked at me, and I saw his face going from scared to intrigued. I put the ball on the ground, rolled it towards him and smiled. He grabbed the ball, picked it up, and looked at me with astonishment. You look just like me, he said. And you look just like me. I mimicked him so nicely that he smiled. Who are you? I don't know. 
Are you lost? Yes, I am lost. Wait here. I'll call my mum. She'll help you. He started running towards the house, and I saw my plan ruined just like that. I had to do something. No, wait. Don't call your mum. If she saw that we looked the same, she'd... Um, she'd... I tried to convince him. How hard could that be? She'd freak out, and she'd get angry. Maybe she'll leave me out in the woods. I don't want to go there. It's scary. So what do we do? How do we get you back to your home, to your parents? I... Um, I don't have parents. I'm alone. I don't have anywhere to go. He started thinking. I looked at his face and wondered if he even understood what it's like not to have parents. He probably couldn't process that. For him, it wasn't even possible, but he knew that it was a terrible thing because I saw his face struggle to find something to say, but how could a seven-year-old boy know what to say to someone who doesn't have parents or a home? So he just stretched his hands out, and with them, the ball. Do you want to play? I knew I had to do it even if I didn't want to, so I jumped with fake excitement. Yes, I want to play. After about half an hour, it was time to go back inside, and that's what I had been waiting for. He carefully sneaked me in from the back door without his mother noticing. He did a very nice thing once we got into his room. He gave me some of his clothes to wear. I changed out of the old dirty rag I was carrying myself in into his clean, soft clothes. It felt so good. I'd never had anything else to wear. Certainly not this clean. I gave him a smile. Genuine one this time. At dinner time, he asked me to stay inside and he went to get some food. I could hear him talking with his mother. Mom, can I take this to my bedroom? Why, honey? Are you okay? Is something wrong? His mother asked him in her sweet voice. No, nothing. I just feel like it. Okay, but finish it all. He entered the room with a plate full of food that I had never seen in my life. Its smell made my stomach teem. We both started eating. He was very slow, but obviously it was not the first time for him. Whereas I gulped everything, especially the vegetables that he didn't even want to touch. And we finished everything. Oh, I'm full, he said. Do you want more? I nodded with my mouth still full of food. He seemed concerned to know that I wanted more. You do? Okay, wait here. Let me see. They went out again and I moved closer to the door to listen. Mum, can I get some more? There was nothing but silence for a few seconds. You what? You finished it? Yes. All of it? Yes, Mum. Can I get some more, please? Sure, but this time you'll eat here. I heard him walk back. He entered and immediately said, looking at me, I'm sorry, I couldn't bring it in. You'll have to go out there if you want more. No, no, I, I cannot go out there. Don't worry, they won't recognize you. Come on, let's exchange our clothes. He then started taking off his clothes. I changed into them and walked to the dining room. I was looking around the house with my mouth wide open. It was so clean and shiny. I could see my face reflecting off of a few surfaces. The whole house was filled with a fragrance of flowers. It was so calm and comfortable and I never felt like this in my life. What are you looking at? Asked his father who was also sitting by the dining table. I shook my head and climbed onto the chair. I looked at my plate and my mouth watered again. I ate all of it while his parents watched me with amazement. I saw them take their plates to the kitchen, so I grabbed mine too, but his mother took it from my hands. It's okay, honey. I got it. Her touch felt soft and warm. It made me envy him for a moment. I walked back into the bedroom, and he was waiting for me. See, I told you, he said. Come on in, it's bedtime. He made me a small bed in his closet space. That was the only thing that looked somewhat similar to my natural habitat, but still it was dry, soft, warm and clean, and free of any stench. I slept peacefully that night for the very first time. Next morning he did something that made me change my heart. 
when he made an excuse to come back into the bedroom so that he could sneak me out from the back door until he was back from school, he handed me his food. Here, it's my lunchbox. You can't get anything to eat out here, and you can't take anything from the fridge. Mum would notice. What are you going to eat? I asked, and I was really curious. Don't worry, I'll eat with my friends. And then he walked away. I stood there with his lunchbox in my hand, thinking that he didn't even care about himself. He gave me his food. Nobody in life has ever given me his food, not even my brother. I felt something that I'd never felt before. At that moment, I changed my plan. I decided that I wouldn't kill him. Chapter 2 Last Forever It had been ten years. He was seventeen now. Time had passed like sand in the wind. I'd taken his bedroom. He'd given it to me himself. He'd been living in the treehouse that we built together in the woods, just a few minutes away from the house. He visited sometimes. I'd go out when he did. He hadn't seen the face of the school in months. I'd been taking his classes, doing his homework, taking exams. I practically was him, minus the fun, because that was his job. He spent his day in the treehouse mostly alone, sometimes with a friend who would bunk his classes thinking that they were doing it together, and his evenings with his girlfriend, his nights partying with friends while I would stay home doing whatever I was supposed to do. I didn't even realize that he'd started using me. One day he just asked me if I wanted to see his school. I was excited, I agreed. He told me about everyone, his friends, his teachers, in the best way he could. I already knew a lot about them as he used to tell me stories. I was the only one he could talk to about his day. It was only when I got to school that I came to find out that he'd done it because he hadn't completed his homework. I received all the scolding and the punishment. He just said he'd forgotten, but I found out he'd completed his homework while I was in school. I didn't mind, though. I mean, he let me stay in his room, shared his clothes and his food. It was the least I could do for him. But over the years, it had become like a routine that I had to do everything that he didn't want to, and he got to do all the things that he liked. I'd hoped that we'd share everything together, but it was still all right. I woke up one day to go through the same boring routine while he was probably asleep in the treehouse. I was silently eating my breakfast, and his parents were in the kitchen talking about something. But are you sure it's safe out there? whispered his mother. Yeah, don't worry. Other rangers will be there with me. We know it's not an animal, his father replied. How do they know that? They found the guard's body intact, but his clothes and belongings were gone. Who could have done that? asked his mother. Who knows, his father replied. I did. I knew what or who had killed that guard. So after his father left, his mother got busy and I left for school, and after that, I went into the woods. I didn't know where to go. I was just looking around. When I saw him, an old guard in his uniform was looking at me from under a tree. He was smiling. I saw him, and I smiled back. I walked towards him. He took a few steps forward and hugged me. I hugged him back tightly. Hey, brother, how are you? I said. Oh, it's been so long, I thought I'd never see you, he replied. How did you find me? Oh, I wasn't even looking for you. You know, I'm allowed now to go out, so I was just exploring the forest when I saw you with a ranger. Yeah, that ranger. That's his father, which reminds me, you killed a guard. Yeah, I didn't want to kill him, man, but he saw me changing. I had no other way. He was going to pull a gun on me. You, uh, what, what if they find out? I started. I know. Well, they would have found out by now. I can't go back. Brother, what are you going to do? I was thinking that maybe, you know, maybe I could stay with you. What? No, you can't stay with me. He won't let you. Why? He let you stay. He was seven then. It's not like that now. 
And he doesn't live with me, he lives in a treehouse near the house. We can't stay together for too long. And when you come in, it's going to be impossible. Come on, brother, I need your help. I have nowhere to go. I can't go back, I can't stay out here. I'll be hunted. If not by our own people, then by those keepers. Keepers don't hunt, I said. Yeah, but they keep sending other people. Please, brother, please. Okay. Okay, I said. Just give me some time. I'll think of something. Okay. Thank you. We talked for about an hour, and then it was time to go home before his parents started to worry. I'll let you know as soon as I figure out something. Sure. I'll wait here until then. You can call me on my new phone. He said as he took a phone out of his pocket, showing it to me, smiling. I quickly snatched the phone out of his hands. Where did you get this? I asked. It belonged to that guard. Why? Look, they can track you with this. Don't you know? I said to his face and threw the phone away. And you can't charge it once it runs out of battery. Okay. Sorry. How are we going to get in touch then? Meet me tomorrow at the treehouse, I said. It's about a mile west from the 11th marker, near the house, same time. Okay, I'll see you there. Bye, and take these. I handed him some chocolates. What? Is this food? Well, kind of, yeah. Uh, they're chocolates. Oh, I've heard so much about them. I heard they're sweet. Well, I laughed. <laughs> sweet doesn't even begin to describe them. I thought you'd enjoy them. Wait till I get you some ice cream. Okay, see you. I left him then in an inebriation caused by those chocolates and returned home. That night I kept thinking about him, though, and also the next morning. I was walking to my class when I heard a commotion. I stopped to look at what was happening when I saw a kid on the ground crying and trying to get up, but a tall, strong boy was holding him down, preventing him from getting up. Everybody was just standing there, watching that kid being humiliated. I looked at the tall boy and sighed. He was one of my classmates and a bully. Everybody hated him. When would he learn to behave? If only there was a way he could be nicer to people. And suddenly, a thought popped in my head. Well, if there was a way he could change. Mm, I finally had a solution to my brother's problem. I walked straight up to that boy and shouted, Hey, jerk. Why don't you go and pick on someone your own size? He turned around and looked at me. Well, what? What are you going to do? He started walking towards me. The small kid got his chance. He picked up his stuff and ran away. Stay away from me, I warned him. I was afraid that I might do some serious damage to him. I had to be careful. <laughs> Try and stop me, he said, and swung a punch in my direction. It was like it took ages for his fist to reach my face. He was slow, even for a human. I blocked his punch with ease and threw him away. He stumbled but turned back and tried to ram into me. I simply stepped away and tripped him. Well, he fell hard on the ground, and everybody laughed. It was like they were rooting for him to get beaten up. But I was only halfway done yet. You're slow. You've always been slow. That's why I got the first punch, I said to him, and watched his face turn red. And he picked himself up and looked at me with rage. This isn't finished. Oh, you want to finish it? I mocked him. Meet me after school at my treehouse. We'll finish it there and then. And then I walked away. I challenged him to a fight, and I made my mind up. In the lunchtime, I began to doubt my decision. I wasn't sure if I could go through with this. I walked around in the corridor when I spotted Madhu, his girlfriend, in our classroom. There was no one else. She was eating lunch and probably humming a song in her head. Then she looked at me and took the earphones out of her ears, smiled and waved at me. I waved back. Then she gestured to me to come over. Now, normally, I'd avoid that, but... Something happened to me, and I walked in. Hey, how are you? I asked. Oh, surprisingly awake. Oh, I almost skipped school today. I still don't get how you do it. 
We were both awake till four in the morning, but you look fresh, just like you do all the time. What's your secret? She finished. Oh, you know, I said, throwing my hand in the air. Drink a lot of water, eat healthily and stuff. Come on, sit down. I sat next to her. We both looked at each other. What's the matter? You look worried. Well, I was surprised. How do you know that? Come on, it's all over your face. Impressive, I thought. Humans are interesting. But nothing, it's just... You can tell me, it's okay. Okay, look. Someone needs my help. A friend and I can help him, but... I might have to do a bad thing to a bad person. I'm just not sure if I should do it. This friend, it's not a girl, right? No, no, he's a guy. Is he a good friend? Yeah, he's the best. He's more than a friend. He's, he's like family. Then do it. I looked at her. What? Yeah, I mean, you clearly want to help him, and that other person, you say is bad? Yes. So maybe he deserves it. Wow, you made it sound so simple. How do you do that? What's your secret? Oh, you know, you can't care about everyone. You just care about the ones you love. Yeah, I guess you're right. I looked into her eyes. I'd never found any human attractive. They all look ugly to me. But at that moment, everything felt different. She was the most beautiful human I'd ever seen. You really are very beautiful, I said. What? You've noticed that just now? She said mischievously. Well, I don't know what came over me. I leaned in and kissed her. She didn't resist. Why would she? For all she knew, I was her boyfriend. It was an unforgettable moment. I wanted it to last forever. That afternoon, I walked to the treehouse after school. As I was on my way, I received a text message. I knew it was from him. He got me this phone so he could stay in contact with me, pass the necessary information and instructions on what to do next. I opened the text and read it. He called me to the treehouse. Oh, since I was already going there, I put my phone back in my pocket without replying. When I reached the treehouse, I saw him waiting for me at the base of the tree. Oh, he seemed angry. He looked at me and said loudly from the distance, You kissed her? Oh, let me explain. Explain? What's there to explain? And who did you beat up? Oh, listen, I... No, you listen. He took out his phone and showed me the texts. I've been receiving texts all day. Hey, nice one. You gave him what he deserves. And this one. Finally someone showed him who's the boss. Man, you're the champ. You embarrassed his bully ass in front of everyone. Oh, and this last one's from her. Do you realize that I was our first kiss in the school? Look, I... Uh, yeah? Now, tell me what's left to explain. What's gotten into your head? You challenged him to a fight? Uh, yes. I jumped on the first moment I had the chance to talk. I challenged him here, so we have to go. We can't be seen together. He might be coming here right now. Oh, I'm here, all right. We both turned back and saw the bully standing a few feet away from us. He had the most annoying smile on his face. So that's your secret. You're twins. That's how you do all that you do. Well, I'm happy I came here early. Are your parents in on this, too? Dude... It's not what it looks like. He began to explain, but the bully interrupted him. Oh, I know exactly what it is. Just wait till your secret is exposed before everyone. Look, no, please don't tell anyone. Look, please, you, you can't do this. He pleaded. I just stood there because I sensed what was going to happen. Oh, I can, and I will, the bully said. No, you won't. The bully looked at us to see who'd said those words, but he was grabbed by the neck and was being lifted in the air by an old guard. We both, I calmly while he in panic, watched the guard squeeze the life out of that bully and throw him aside. Oh, my companion just lost it. His face turned pale and his body started shivering. 
He tried to scream, but barely any sound came out of his mouth. I tried to calm him down. Shh, look, it's okay, don't panic, it's all right. What? What are you? Who are you? What? <laughs> Relax. He, he killed him. It's okay. Nobody's going to find out. Oh, brother, it's not helping. Just do it, I said to my brother. Show him. I thought it might help calm him down, but... But when he saw my brother's skin first turn murky grey with spikes and thorns and hairs, and then again saw it change to take the shape of the bully, he went completely insane. My brother now looked just like the bully. He and I both looked at him and finally introduced ourselves. Meet my brother. We are shapeshifters. Chapter 3 the real monsters. My companion tried to run, but he was so scared that he stumbled, tripped on the roots of a tree and fell to the ground. He hid his head on the tree and fell unconscious. When he woke up, we were deep in the forest. The dead body of the bully was lying at a distance. My brother and I were just waiting for him to wake up, looking at him. He opened his eyes and looked around. It took him a few seconds to remember everything, then he jumped when his eyes locked onto us. Relax. Don't be scared. We're not going to hurt you, my brother said. Who are you? He managed to ask. As my brother told you, we are shapeshifters. We live underground. I know, it's hard to explain. We can take any shape and form. Yes, there are... Other families of shapeshifters all around the world. Some of them are even rich and live with humans. We can blend in easily, you see. But not our family, though. Apparently we are all above this. We don't bother humans. We believe in peace and harmony, even though it means we have to wear sacks and eat garbage. My brother here ran away ten years ago. Well, I get why he did it. We could be anybody, live any life we want, but we choose... What? Misery? My brother was speaking without any breaks. He probably wanted to say this for a long time. I too just kept listening. After my brother ran away, our elders tightened the security, otherwise I would have run too. They allowed me to go out when I came of age, and it was time for me to hunt for food myself. I was just looking for food when I saw my brother. You know we can identify our own kind in any form. It's more like changing clothes to us. I mean, you can identify your known ones even if they are in different clothes, right? Unfortunately, oh, I killed a guard while I was hunting. If there's one thing our family hates, it's killing. I was scared to go back, so my brother came up with this solution. I'll take the dead guy's place and nobody will notice. He was listening quietly. His face emitted hatred and resentment. You guys... A monsters, he said. What did you say? asked my brother. But then he looked at me and said, You use me. I was taken aback, but before I could say anything, my brother spoke again. We used you. That's typical. So typical of you humans. You use everything and everyone, even your kind, and then you blame others. We used you... You used my brother for all these years, but he said nothing because he at least had a home. We used you. We sleep in the dirt because of you. You humans. You think you're the only intelligent beings on this planet? You live in delusion. You can't stand the fact that there could be anyone superior to you, or even just like you. You don't have the slightest idea of how many kinds of creatures live in hiding just because of you. Your governments hide any proof and cover up anything that could dethrone you from the uh, most intelligent being on the planet. You try to fool yourselves with your space programs, pretending to look for the truth. Can you handle the truth? Let me tell you the truth. Ah, my brother was sparkling with rage. I knew he'd always wanted this. To throw the truth in their faces. And now he'd gotten his chance. We moved so close to him that his face was just a few inches away from his. And then he let out the truth. Aliens have been living among you for millennia. They were here even before humans. 
practically worship them as gods. You don't have the slightest idea of how many creatures of the dark lure in Crime City. Probably more than the actual criminals. Or the rest of the country, or the world. Some of you are trying to fight them, but they're all fighting an already lost war. You have a delusion that this world is run by humans. You know nothing about this world. You wouldn't learn it in your schools and definitely not in your books because you're the ones who wrote them. You live in a bubble of your own making. You do each other wrong all the time. Manipulate each other. Even kill. You do it every day like it's routine. The irony is that you call us monsters. Look what you have done to this planet. The truth is that you are the real monsters. My brother then took a deep but calm breath. Then he looked at him again and said, So, now that everything's out in the open, we've established some facts, have judged each other enough. I only have one question. Can you keep your mouth shut? We'll go out there. Everything will go as it was supposed to go. Nobody will know anything. So, will you do it? It's up to you. We both looked at him and waited. He first looked at my brother and then at me, contemplating the situation. One part of me wanted to say yes, but why only a part, I wondered. He seemed to have decided something. He looked straight at my brother, cleansed his jaw and said, No! My brother then looked away and closed his eyes in disappointment. He took a deep breath and then, All right. This settles everything, he said, and grabbed him by his neck and picked him up like he was just a doll. I saw him struggle. His blood-filled eyes met mine for a moment. He couldn't say anything, but I knew he was pleading to me for help. I looked at him, and I remembered. He was the boy who'd given me shelter, fed me every day for ten years, gave me his clothes, shared his room, his life with me. I remembered that I decided that I wouldn't kill him. I almost opened my mouth to say something, but I remembered that this was also the boy who'd used me. Used me like a slave. I was just like a pet to him. But it doesn't matter, I thought. What he did for me was way more than what he used me for. And I would still have stopped my brother, but I remembered something else. I remember the soft, warm touch of her lips on mine. I remember the fragrance of her hair and her skin. I remembered the kiss, and I remembered that I wanted that to last forever. So I just turned and looked away without saying anything. After a few seconds, I heard a thud when his body hit the ground. I didn't look at it. I just turned to my brother. Change your clothes. Hide the bodies. We'll get rid of them later. Right. Now we have to stage a fight at the treehouse and come up with a reason to be friends. I then threw a quick look at the lifeless body of my companion and walked away. Ah, oh, you think you're clever, don't you? You humans, with your technology and your stuff. Think you're clever, don't you? With your technology and all that stuff you've got. Ah, oh, you think you're so clever, don't you? You humans, hey? <laughs> well, interesting story indeed. Did you like that one? thought that was very, very cool. I love the way it was written. And, well, yeah, that's exactly how we would behave if we had a doppelganger, wouldn't it? You do all the boring stuff and I'll go and have all the fun. Well, that's um, it for now. Might be back again later, not quite sure yet. Got another story recorded, might be releasing it this evening, might not. Well, till next time, very, very sweet dreams, and bye bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. Really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook. Twitter, Instagram, you can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like, throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams, and bye-bye.